Hi and thanks for stopping by. Um, in this recording I'm going to do a review of a book that has been uh, quite significant to me in my studies and um, in my kind of development of thinking around gender and um, what that means in society but also what that means in terms of being a woman and um, kind of our biology and our DNA build up. So I'm going to uh, talk you through the female brain um, which is by Luan uh, Brizendine or Brizendine, depending on how you pronounce it, I guess. Um, and this was recommended to me um, across one of my, uh, through one of my professors across my university course that I'm doing. Um, and I kind of took it with both hands, really, and really wanted to read it. Just like I said, to gain an understanding of self and hormones um, and to kind of get a connection with the more biological side, even though my research is very interactivist. Um, so I'm looking at um, people's stories, people's perceptions, people's experiences. Um, when we think about a nature nurture debate, for me, I couldn't enter that without kind of knowing a little bit about the other side. So that's what drew me to this book. Um, it's got great reviews, that was another thing that drew me, and one thing I'd say before you read a book is look at the comments um, and people's thoughts, people's opinions, although you'll always take what you take from it, sometimes you can gather and learn things from um, the views of other people, which I guess is what you guys are doing listening to me uh, ramble on today. So, <clears throat> uh, the first thing I wanted to kind of draw your attention to with this book is the structure. Um, I'll talk about the start in a second, but the structure is... Uh, very much dependent looking at the life course of a woman. Uh, so it's looking at what happens when we are conceived, when we are very young, when we grow up through teenage years, um, women's kind of sexual entity, and then moves on to um, being a mature woman, menopause, um, and, what, and what goes along with that in terms of our hormone development and hormone growth. Um, at the end of the book, there's um, also a section called appendices and within that is lots and lots of useful things so if any of you are studying or going to read this book um, for the purpose of academia um, it's really useful in terms of connecting to the empirical research that uh, Luan draws upon um, in her arguments. There's a connection between this book and um, the mosaic of gender which I've done a book review on so check that out as well um, but there's a connection which I'm going to draw back to at the end and as I go through if you have listened to the other one you'll probably be able to make those connections yourself um, but I'm going to connect that <clears throat> at the end because it's an interesting double side take on um, this debate around nature nurture. So the opening section of this book then describes the key hormones in our body, their purpose, um, and their influence and like most people I would say I'm quite aware of most of the key hormones that influence us or I thought I was um, but there's some new ones in there for me as well um, I'm going to check I'm saying this right but androstadine is um, one that was new to me that I learned from this book and that is the mother if you like the mother of testosterone which comes from our ovaries um, and it is that thing that supplies the sassiness uh, in in women it creates kind of a high spirited um, feeling in youth in young people tends to wane off at menopause and when the ovaries stop um, producing um, this hormone stops producing as well. So for me, this book was really insightful in terms of understanding myself, um, in terms of <clears throat> being able to go, oh, okay, that's that's why I feel like that, or you know, that's what's pulling me in that direction. Um, so really useful in terms of kind of personal growth and connection as well. Um, one of the other kind of really interesting things at the start of this book, and I've will put a picture of this in the comments below, um, is it talks you through the phases of um, a human's life and it compares um, men and women and it looks at the different um, periods of life that women go through and men go through and it compares the hormones um, that are prominent which goes some way to explaining behaviour changes and some way to explaining, um, you know, this concept of men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Um, I don't believe that. Um, but in terms of understanding the behaviour differences that are so obvious and so prominent to us in society. Um, 
So again, really useful uh, connections if anyone's looking at that kind of thing um, for self-growth or for study. So I'm going to jump to um, page 29 now. And page 29 for me, again, was one of the first things, I'm, I'm a bit of a sticky note freak, and was one of those first kind of markers that I put on here. Um, and it talks about the need to understand our biological makeup. Um, key to understanding how we are wired and the key to understanding self so that self doesn't control us. Now, for me, um, I have some alignment to critical realism, I think, in my in my kind of emerging um, identity. And for those of you not sure what that is, um, it's about this understanding that there's there's something and it's our interpretation of that truth or that um, reasoning. Um, so for me, I think there's always that need to question things, that need to ask why. Why do I feel like that? Why? What is it in me that's doing this? And um, Luan states very clearly um, on page 29 that we need to understand our biological makeup because we need to have an awareness. If we are very aware that we are in a process or a time in our monthly cycle, for example, where we are having a testosterone uh, influx, then that is going to influence how we behave, how we think. Um, and actually, it's quite a powerful position to be a very empowered position to know and understand your body's reactions and to know why you're feeling and thinking the way you are. Um, so that was a bit of an eye opener to me. Because if you're aware of the fact you're, of what your biological brain state is, you can guide your impulses or you can choose to act differently or you are in a position of empowerment because you have more understanding and more control uh, over over your body and over your mind. Very early on in this book, and this is the connection I make again to um, the mosaic of gender, is this nature-nurture debate comes back. Um, and this idea that Luan talks through this concept that actually biology is influenced by social construction. Um, and it has the influence to control and change structures in the brain. Um, so I thought that was a bit bizarre. Um, so I went and looked up some of the studies that Luan has referenced as part of her research. Um, and what she's arguing is that on average, males and females have the same level of intelligence. Um, but when boys and girls hit their teenage years, differences start to happen. So <clears throat> when if we think about maths, let's think about kind of a really simple example and a very stereotypical example. Uh, maths and science um, capacity in kind of society's argument is that boys are better at maths and science than girls are. Um, but actually what Luan is saying here is that, that that's a very typical stereotype that has been reinforced, 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 but it isn't backed up biology. Um, actually the biological brain of a teenage girl and a teenage boy, if we're thinking in binary terms, um, actually what's going on behind those kind of uh, gazed over hormone eyes isn't that boys are better at science and math than girls but actually when girls reach a certain age their body um floods kind of their estrogen and their brain with emotions uh triggered for social connection and those are massively a priority uh, in the brains of young girls which is where kind of really tight friendships come from, where communication, I'm thinking of my daughters and texting, me and texting, um, or messaging. Um, having that communication cycle is really important in the brains of, of females at that point, whereas it isn't so much in males. And what Luann is stating here is that actually when we have two very different uh, brain structures in that sense, what's happening is society is refilling those. Society is, um, <clears throat> not refilling, but, um, falling back into that pattern. So if girls are more sociable, then tend to what happens is that um, girls will um, engage in or we will provide for activities, structures, experiences for girls promoting that. Whereas boys are more driven to different things because of their biological makeup. And the more we um, socially construct that rather than um, providing different opportunities, the more we're feeding into that. And I mentioned on one of the other videos, um, a BBC um series or a, a one-off called um no more gender children and within that they look at trying to bring that back they give children 
of both genders or both sexes um, puzzles to do. And what they found was once girls have gone so far, it's really difficult to get their brain habits and their brain abilities back to the same level as boys um, because they've almost veered off in two paths. Um, so this nature nurture boat, Luan's uh, argument, Luan says is it's kind of irrelevant because child development is very much extrinsically, extrinsically both tied together. We cannot have one without the other. Um, society influences our biological makeup, has the ability to change cells in, in our DNA. And so it's a, a no-win situation. We have to have uh, both together. Um, building on that, Luanne um, continues, I can't remember if it's the page after or the page before, but she talks about the fact that fewer women end up in science has nothing to do with the female brain being rubbish at math and science, but rather how much exposure girls have compared to boys because of how society treats men and women differently. Um, and that continuous feed, those continuous experiences um, fuel, if you will, that stereotyping that goes on. And which means we're never going to have a different outcome because we're in a cycle, we're in a trap. Um, moving into the first real section of this um, book, Luanne talks about, um, as I said at the beginning, it's structured in terms of the life development of um, of a woman and talks very much about brain development conception, um, which is really interesting to me because I teach and um, I lecture on child development modules. And for me, this is something that really resonated with my knowledge and understanding. Um, but Luanne puts it in a lovely way. She says, you know, the majority of brain development that determines sex specific circuits, so the things that influence um, our sexes, happens in the first 18 weeks of pregnancy. Until 18 weeks, every fetal brain looks female, okay? So nature's default setting of brain structures and hormones is female. And that was a really interesting fact for me um, because in the eighth week of development after conception, it's testosterone that changes that. It's testosterone that comes in at different levels um, and different amounts to change the sex and the gender of a fetus. At eight weeks then, testosterone influences this um, this brain. It kills off some of the cells in the communication centres and grows more in aggression centres. Um, so if we've got a fetus at eight weeks, there is suddenly what's known as, um, that I've seen in research a lot, called the testosterone drop. And that is where it is at that point when it is decided, depending on how much testosterone comes in, as to whether that child is going to be biologically male or biologically female. Um, and that testosterone drop is doing two things. It's firstly killing off cells in the communication centres. Remember we talked about the fact that females' brains have that oestrogen drive to communication, whereas males don't, so that's significant here. Um, but also it grows more in aggression centres. And again, we've got all these stereotypes that men are more aggressive than women. I don't actually think that's particularly true, um, but I, I, it's a stereotype in society. Um, again, one that could be refueling um, this ideal. All, and we all get angry, don't we? Women get angry just as much as men, um, driven by different hormones and different circumstances. But the more we pander to that as a society, the more we're fueling that stereotype. Um, so eight weeks, of a development point is really significant. Um, think back to the gender mosaic um, here, and this is one challenge that really stood out to me between reading these two books. Um, the gender mosaic challenges this concept to say that it's not binary um, that we have testosterone or not. So if we think about Luan's example, at eight weeks we have this testosterone dump and that separate whether we're going to have a male or a female brain. Um, what the gender mosaic is saying actually that, you know, we, we can agree that this testosterone dump happens and it is significant and it changes things, but it isn't a case of splitting into two. It isn't a case of splitting into binary, but rather it's a case of creating multiple different options, multiple different mosaics, if you will, of each individual unique person as to how much testosterone comes into their body or into their brain at eight weeks um, in development. And that then triggers in that unique person 
their communication centres, their aggression centres. So we can see quite a conflicting um, perspective there and that's useful and important to know in terms of our critical thinking that we're not taking things at face value, that we're comparing different research and different authors. Um, <clears throat> page 38, so moving kind of through this then, um, baby girls are born more interested in emotional expression. Um, for those of you who have had children or you've had siblings or you know um, babies that you've been around um, those funny faces that we pull at children those big smiles and those oh that lovely voice that we put on um, research has shown that generally in society we do that a lot more to baby girls than we do to baby boys um, which I think is really sad actually um, but that's what the data is coming through us um, and that's cause for concern in terms of research because as we've looked at in terms of the eight week testosterone dump if you haven't had such a big increase in testosterone that means that your estrogen levels are going to have your communication centers firing from the day you're born if you're a little girl if we're thinking about luan's binary concept here um which means that little girls tend to be born much more observant, much more um, aware of communication. And emotional expression plays a really significant part in that. Every touch, every cuddle, every stroke, every eye contact, every smile for a child, especially young girls, is building up their self-worth, building up their self-worthiness, learning who we can trust, this person's safe, they make me feel good, I feel safe, I feel warm, I feel loved. So action from people in contact with them is vital, from parents to siblings to practitioners um, to doctors. They all have um, an influence in a very, very short amount of time over that child's um, development. If we were to take that face away, that smile, that nice voice, and we'd have a very blank or a very um, non-emotive face. Babies really struggle with that um, because that expression is what children latch onto when they are very little. Um, and it's their touchstone for reality, Luan says. So that flat face interprets emotionless. It's a signal that that child isn't doing something right. And they'll continue to try that until they do get it right. They'll continue, if you look at a child with a very blank face, they will start to do things. They will start to whinge or whimper. They will start to smile at you or they'll start to put their tongue out at you. They will do things to try and trigger you. Um, which is why when people say to me, well, working with babies is boring, they don't do anything, really frustrates me because there's so much going on in their communication um, there or should be if they're stimulated and this um, jumping ahead a little bit in Luann's book here was really fascinating um, point for me because if we think about women who are in abusive relationships or um, girls who are developing unhealthy relationships usually with the opposite sex um, there's a, a, a connection here to lack of communication if men or women but let's go with uh, this binary concept for men for a moment at the mo uh, for now if we have a girl who has grown up um with a very supportive emotional connection being smiled at having having you know that warmth that self-worth um highly developed in her and then gets into a relationship with an emotionally unavailable man they will constantly be trying to uh, do exactly what a baby does. They will constantly be trying to change something about themselves, uh, blame themselves, do something to get that positive reaction, that self-validation from that other person. Because if I do this right, if I smile or I dress or I behave like this, then he's going to love me. He's going to smile back. I'm going to get that emotion from him. And that's a really dangerous position to be in, isn't it, uh, for both children and um, for women as we grow up, because being emotionally available is a really important and powerful thing within society. So I thought that was quite an interesting connection that she um, makes there to emotion. Does nurture mean we don't provide the same level of emotional interaction with boys? Well, this was a question that came to me as I was reading through this. Um, if we say girls are specifically drawn to that emotional connection from the moment they're born and 
the data is saying we don't do this as much to boys um, when they're little, then that for me is a bit of an alarm signal going off. You know, we, we live in a society where we can see kind of movements supporting um, this concept of, of real men cry and um, this concept of, you know, emotions in men is not something that should be hidden. Um, but yet the data is suggesting as babies, we are not developing their emotions in the same way. We're not triggering their, um, their self-worth, their self-love from what, how we're interacting with them. So that's something that's a bit of an alarm bell to me that um, I wonder what you think. Um, but the reactions and the way we treat young boys, babies, influences their sense of emotions and self-worth in exactly the same way. It just doesn't tend to be that we do it that way in society. So I wonder what your um, opinions on that would be. Drop it in the comment. I'd be, I'd be really interested to know your experience of that. <clears throat> Moving on a little bit further then. Um, Luan talks about stress as a real significant factor in brain development for both men and women. Um, but she's focusing here on the female brain for the key of her book. Um, Luan talks about stress in pregnancy specifically um, and the neurological incorporation of that begins from the moment we conceive. Um, now, for those of you who study child development, you might know what I mean by the phrase teratogens, um, but, but we need to be mindful of things that influence um, neurologically and kind of um, for benefit and for harm of mother and baby. And that's why you know, there's a lot of antenatal care, um, a lot of push to kind of support women who are pregnant. And there's been a lot of flags in society over my lifetime um, around stress and pregnancy. But um, Luan talks about here, maternal stress affects the emotional and stress hormones in the offspring. So that baby inside is being directly influenced by the same stress that the mother is. Um, and cortisol, which is our stress hormone in our body, can be heightened in a baby and have that influence later on in life. So the generational cycle between stress from a mum through to baby, and that can be a generational cycle all the way until it's broken. Um, and that generational problem is really dangerous, isn't it? We live in a stressful society. We live with a norm of chaos. How we interpret that, how we deal with that, how we learn to cope with those stress mechanisms um, is vital. And when we're supporting children, we're supporting families, we're supporting mums, um, that needs to be a forefront. Because otherwise we are carrying on this cycle, this generational cycle um, of stress-induced pregnancies. And that's not a place we need to be at. Um, so if anyone you know is pregnant, do everything you can to, um, you know, take daily stresses out of their life. It's important. Page 51 talks about, <clears throat> I've got a quote here that I um, picked out for you. Nature certainly has the strongest hand in launching sex-specific behaviours, but experience, practice and interaction with others can modify neurons and brain wiring. So those specific, and we'll come back to the nature-nurture debate here, nature being biology launches those um, testosterone, those estrogen behaviours we have. But what Luan is stating very clearly here is it's the practice interaction with others that modifies those brain connections. So again, we've come back to this nature nurture debate. We can't have one without the other. Um, those of you who have looked at brain makeups before will know the kind of the phrases myelination and um, to, and kind of the importance of that in terms of our neurons and our connections in our brain. But essentially, the more we do things. Um, the tighter those connections get, that can be a good thing, that can be a bad thing. Um, if we have tight connections with positive outcomes, positive experiences, positive behaviours, wonderful. But we also tend to have positive, uh, negative connections and thick myelination there. So the more we do things, the harder it can be to undo them, but also if it's a positive, the stronger it can become. Um, so the more society panders to these stereotypes, the more men are going to do certain things or women are going to do certain things. And that's the cycle we need to break. Because the influences of other people are really significant and can reinforce this synaptic connection um, and myelination, or it can change it. Um, so really, really vital. 
Um, so Luan moves through the book and you can kind of see my sticky notes turn from pink to green as she moves through the different ages. And although I don't have the scope in this, um, in this video to go through the entire book, um, I just kind of wanted to jump through to the teenage brain. I have teenage daughters myself. Um, and so this was a really significant part for me, but also in understanding myself, uh, I know what I was like when I was a teenager um, and kind of understanding some of those hormonal impulses was really useful for me. Um, again, a bit more knowledge about self and, and how we work. So, the book keeps moving up through childhood into teenage years um, and one of the kind of teen brain connections that I picked out of this was back to messaging. Now bear in mind we've already talked about the fact that females are wired for communication, that testosterone uh, typically um, kind of leaves women alone is, is the view but I don't necessarily agree with that, but we have less than men and therefore communication is something that we strive for um, and we react to as women. Page 64 gives a case study of a teenage girl, um, a, quite a typical teenage girl you might say, glued to a phone. Um, and she's described as having a very drugged look upon her face while she's waiting for that text return. And I'm sure you know uh, what I mean by those three dots in WhatsApp or on, messenger, on any messenger platform, um, waiting for that response and that addiction to kind of wanting that, seeing that, needing that kind of response and that return. And what is going on there? Where I do it myself, I see it in my children, see it in most of society. But what is going on there is the test, is the, the hormone, sorry, the estrogen, um, kind of figure, firing that kind of need, that demand. It's a very chemical um reaction in our head and this child this girl in this case study was uh, denied her phone because her grades at school were dropping but then it talks through the consequences this had and there's a biological reason for this behavior that Luan's saying because connecting through talking activities actually activates pleasure centers in our brain as a female um, sharing secrets having romantic connections possible uh, sexual implications via messages activates those centers even more it's a heightened now we're not talking about a small amount of pleasure here we're talking a huge huge dopamine and oxytocin rush and dump into the brain which <clears throat> luan describes as being the fattest biggest neurological reward outside of an orgasm so it is a huge um release or a dump i suppose in terms of the hormones that you get at that point and that's so quite addictive. And that's where we kind of say, you know, we're addicted to our phones, we're addicted to social media, is because it gives us that um, dopamine and oxytocin rush, um, which is something quite amazing, really. And something that I think when you realize what's going on, um, we can learn to either tame that addiction or we can understand it a bit more. So dopamine is the chemical that stimulates the motivation and pleasure circuits in the brain. And estrogen in puberty, as Luan says, um, increases both the dopamine and oxytocin production in girls, which is why, um, as the case study talks about, they're using the case of a teenage girl because they are prime in their neurology and the neurolog neurological development um, for those estrogen and dopamine and oxytocin levels to be high. So it's no wonder essentially teenage girls teenagers in general but teenage girls are kind of sitting ducks they're waiting to be drawn into this world of communication however that looks for them and that was something quite um interesting to me that was something that i took from this um that, that although i was aware of addiction um for social media communication actually explaining the mindset the hormones behind that at that specific age uh, was interesting so two more things I want to kind of uh, draw your attention to before I finish up. That next one is page 70, talks about um, two specific differences between men and women. And that is the phrase fight or flight, which I'm sure you've all heard of before. Uh, fight or flight meaning we stay and we, we deal, we fight or we're off, we do one and we're, we're flighting it. And Luan talks about that's a very masculine, um, 
or male way of dealing with things because of the hormones and the testosterone levels in males' brains. If you think about the anger um, um, parts of the brain that are stimulated at eight weeks when that testosterone dump comes in. Um, whereas actually an opposite to that, or not an opposite, but a female version of that, Luan says, is actually tend and befriend. Women are much more likely than men to stay and deal with a problem if there's a social connection. We stay and befriend somebody and tend to them rather than this more binary idea of either stay or leave, that women are actually much more stuck in the middle of that um, and will often try and deal with the situation, try and come at it in um, an emotional stance. Um, if you've ever witnessed two people having an argument, um, some people might be out of there before, you know, anything said, but often in my experience, I can probably relate to this, I try and figure it out, try and um, come to some sort of middle ground, try and get people to see each other from different perspective. So befriending people. Um, and again, I thought that was a really interesting uh, concept that tend and befriend rather than fight or flight. So again, I'd appreciate your thoughts on that. And finally then, page 239, so I'm jumping uh, way ahead now to kind of rounding up the book. And it talks about um, sexual orientation. So I am very much in the mindset that, <clears throat> before I read this book actually, in the mindset that we have a biological sex that is the thing that determines our genitals. We have a gender, which is how we relate to the world and ourselves. Um, and then we have sexuality. And before I read this book, I wasn't too sure, if I'm honest, how sexuality fitted into biological sex and gender. Where did it fit on a spectrum? But actually, Luann paints a nice picture here, quite an explanatory picture for me, and talks about sexual orientation doesn't appear to be a matter of conscious self-labeling, but rather a matter of brain wiring. So she's connecting it more to the biological side to me. And if I think about stories in the media or people um, that I know who um, are heterosexual or homosexual, um, that idea of, you know, it's not a choice. Being gay, being straight, being bisexual, whatever, is not a choice, it's who I am. And that for me resonates with what Luann's saying here in terms of actually sexuality connects to more our brain and our structure and our genetic makeup than a self-choice of gender. But that doesn't stop the stereotypes, doesn't it? It doesn't stop the stereotypes of, oh, don't wear that because you look gay or don't do that or don't say that because you'll be gay. And that kind of idea that society somehow changes people's sexual orientation um, and lump it together with gender. And I very much want to kind of make that point that they're very separated. And Luann argues that actually sexuality is much more driven to a sexual orientation. Uh, sorry, to a sexual makeup, um, a genetic makeup. She wrote a whole chapter on this, but it considers the influence of balance of testosterone and estrogen, amongst others, um, in the experiences we have in the utero. And this connects back to stress. Stress in pregnancy um, has the ability to, as do other things, but has the ability to change the genetic coding and the makeup, the, um, the outcome, if you will, of our cells as we grow within the womb. Um, and one of those things is sexual orientation. So stress, um, although I haven't read the study that she, that Luanne kind of refers to on that, um, so I'm taking her word for it, that actually stress can change um, those parts of our brain responsible for sexual orientation right from when we're kind of being developed in the womb. And that's quite an amazing thing. It shows the, it, the importance, but also the dangers of stress. And it also, for me, takes away the connection between sexual orientation and gender and puts sexual orientation much more back in with biology. The behavioural expression of brain um, will then be influenced and shaped by the environment of culture. So, again, we're coming back to this nature-nurture debate. Sexual orientation might be connected to how we develop the genes we have, the genetic makeup, how stress has impacted whilst we're in our mum's uh, womb. But actually, when we're born with that, it's then very much dependent on the culture, the environment, the shaped um, that society build us, the construction of society. And again, I can think of friends of mine who have been born into certain cultures where being gay is just not acceptable. 
So had they been born into a different culture, um, they might have had a very different life experience. Um, so we've still got this nature nurture, one with that can't have one without the other debate. Um, okay. Those are all the key points that I wanted to lift out um, for the video and the things that I've taken from it. Like always, there is, you know, a million things I could talk about about this book, um, but it is worth a read. Um, it's helped me understand a lot about myself, a lot about my children, a lot about um, my my positioning in terms of my um, hormonal state. Um, I have, since reading this actually, it was on my kind of to-do list anyway, but this has really kick-started me. Um, as a woman tracking my periods, now I've always had very regular periods and um, what I'm starting to be able to do is track and predict my hormone changes. Um, and that's a really empowering way to understand self um, and to think about the reasons as to why I'm feeling this way or behaving certain ways. And then I can make a choice about that. Um, I would encourage people to do the same or give it a go or um, reach out and have a chat to me about it because it's been really useful in terms of my personal development and personal growth. Appendices in the back of the book are useful. I think I said that earlier on um, because you can connect to the research that the author is looking at. Again, don't take things for granted. Always try and get back to the source if you can. It's a useful critical stance um, from that of the mosaic approach, which I talked about at the start in the idea that this Luan is talking about a female brain. The Mosaic Approach um, book that I've talked about in another video says, actually, we can't have a binary. There's no such thing as a female brain or a male brain. We are a combination of the two. So that's something for you to make your own mind up out. Um, now I've given you both sides of that information. Um, but either way, they're both very interesting reads. Um, and a female brain is definitely one I would recommend um, to having a look through i will put my notes as usual and um that picture that i talked about earlier on into the comments um under this video but please do let me know what you thought um and yeah if you read it from this let me know um and if you have read it before i'd be interested to see whether you took the same from it from me um but it's been influential in my development so hopefully part of that was useful for you um and until next time Thanks for your time. See you later.